Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Salvation by Grace and we're looking at how God in His grace has received us because Jesus Christ came to die for us on the cross. And this is the heart of the Christian message. It shows how that God loves us and wants to save us and therefore has dealt with our sin fully and finally forever on the cross of Jesus Christ. Now we know that this is rooted in Old Testament teaching about sacrifice. The Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. And so God established a, a very elaborate system of sacrifice. Much of it had to do with animal sacrifice, the shedding of blood. Now we know that the blood of bulls and goats could never ever take away sins. God is not thirsty for the blood of animals, that's a repugnant thought. But what he was doing was teaching us that there was coming somebody who would be the sacrifice that would take away the sins of the world. And that's exactly what John the Baptist said when he pointed to Jesus as the Christ and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus Christ became the substitute sacrifice for the sins of all the world and that means as we believe in Jesus, so we are saved because God's wrath is turned away because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now there's another theme that we're going to be looking at today and that's the theme of the covenants of grace. And this theme has to do with God entering into a binding agreement with people sometimes individuals, sometimes families, and sometimes even a whole nation. These are His covenants of grace. They are all to do with grace because God Himself steps in and says, I will be your God and you will be my people. So we're going to examine how these covenants of grace are developed in the Old Testament. Hello and welcome back to this teaching session on the Sword of the Spirit, Salvation by Grace. We've come quite away in the manual so far and we're coming now to the point in section four where we're teaching on the covenants of grace. And there's one central thread that's running throughout all of this teaching and that is that salvation is by grace. It's something that needs to be stressed because it's grace that will get us to heaven. And it's grace that will teach our hearts to bless God and to live for Him and enable us to do all that He wants us to do. So we come to this topic of covenant. During the Last Supper, when Jesus and his apostles gathered together to eat the Passover meal, he took a loaf of bread, he broke it, he gave thanks for it, and he handed it around with the words which are recorded in the Gospels, this is the new covenant. And uh, he took the cup, he gave thanks for it, it's the new covenant in my blood. And uh, this is the blood of my covenant, and it's poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. When we think of the communion meal, therefore we always go back in our minds to the Passover celebration. And remember that blood was the central part of that celebration. Through the shedding of blood, the people were released from the judgment of God. And so we understand now that God is saying, in the New Covenant, there is fresh blood that is to be shed because there's a fresh binding agreement between God and His people, which promises forgiveness. Now, to understand the New Covenant properly, we've got to go back to see the Old Covenants. I wonder if you notice this every time we come to a point like this in the Sword of the Spirit series, we always go back into the Old Testament. Because you see, there's not just one testament, there are two testaments which make one Bible. And in the Old Testament we have the foundation of the things which we build upon in the New Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, we find in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 18, 
the first mention of a covenant. And this covenant lays down many, many principles which seem to be true of all the other covenants that follow. Here, God says to Noah, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. We notice, first of all, that this covenant comes from God's initiative. God made a binding agreement with Noah in which he promised salvation by grace. It was not a contract between two equal partners, not a parity contract or a parity treaty. No, it was a contract or a treaty uh, between God and Noah. It did benefit both parties. It was all of grace, all of God, and all for Noah's family's benefit and salvation in a time of judgment. God simply announced to Noah that he would establish his covenant with him. It was God's covenant. He established it. It was a sovereign dispensation of saving grace from and by God to Noah and his family. Even though the covenant was all grace, Noah's family had to respond to that grace by entering into the ark, and only then would they experience the benefits of this covenant salvation. So we can say the covenant was all grace, but Noah's family had to appropriate the promise by faith-filled obedience. Now, I want you to grasp this point here. It was faith response which brought Noah into the covenant, and that involved a faith-filled obedient act. And that faith-filled obedient act was, of course, building the ark, but then, all importantly, entering into that ark. Now, remember, salvation is by faith, not by works. The action of believing God and trusting themselves to the ark was the action of faith in which they committed their lives to what they said they believed. So that corresponds today to us taking an active step in believing in Jesus Christ and stepping into the ark, which is Jesus, that we might be, by faith, rescued from the judgment. Now, after the flood had subsided, God repeated his covenant promise, promise to Noah and his family. And in Genesis 9, verses 9 to 17, we find out what happened, and it reveals what seems to me to be the clear, essential details of covenant agreements. Once again, there's no bilateral agreement. It was plainly all grace, all God's initiative and action, and all for the benefit of Noah's family. When we look at it in detail, we see these following principles. This covenant was willed and initiated and established by God entirely. It was all of him. We also see that this covenant was universal in scope. It embraced not only Noah, but also his descendants. And this proves that the giving grace of God is not dependent on a favorable response by the beneficiaries. So in other words, God made this covenant between Noah and all of mankind. And that has nothing to do with us. We enter into that covenant simply because we are human beings. It's there. This covenant also was unconditional. There were no preconditions or requirements. God simply said, I'm not going to judge the world by water. I'm, 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 I'm going to make sure that the seed time and harvest will not fail. There were no ongoing obligations. Whether the world's a wicked place, seed time and harvest will not fail. This shows that it's impossible for the covenant to be broken. We also see that there was, with this covenant, an affirming and confirming sign, the rainbow. And this rainbow could not be controlled or manipulated by humanity. It was, again, God's provision, God's guarantee of his faithfulness. And we see this covenant is everlasting. There is never uncertainty about an unconditional promise. So we have some basic principles of covenant found in Noah's life. Next, we move to Abraham. And we know that God spoke to Abraham while he was in uh, uh, Haran to leave for Canaan. Many years later, God confirmed his word. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, uh, God says to Abraham, there confirming this covenant, after these things the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. Abraham. 
your exceedingly great reward. Here, God's word, which would later build into a covenant, is confirmed. Now, of course, by this time, we see clearly in verses 2 and 3 of this passage that Abraham was questioning God about the way the promise was going to be fulfilled. He said, but Abraham, God, what? But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, no one born in my house is my heir. Now, God replied to Abraham in verses 4 and 5, and uh, said, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. And so Abraham looked up in the sky, and he saw God's promise to him, and he believed. And then in verse 6, we have a very crucial verse. It's the cornerstone verse of our understanding of justification by faith. Paul bases his whole teaching of justification by faith on this verse. James also bases all his teaching on justification by faith on this verse. And Paul and James, incidentally, do not contradict each other. They're talking about different aspects. Uh, Paul is talking about being justified in our relationship with God, and James knows that is by faith. But James also goes on to say, it's not enough for you to be right with God. How about also being right with the people next door to you? And when he talks about that justification, that's not by faith alone. It's no good to say to the person next door, go and be, be, be warmed. I hope you have a good meal. If you've got the means, you should provide that meal for that needy brother. Your faith isn't going to save that person. Your faith isn't going to help that person. So they're talking about totally different things. And uh, so James says you're justified by works, not just by faith alone, meaning in your relationship with your neighbor, you are justified to them and before them in their eyes by what you do, not just by what you say you believe, but in your relationship to God, you are justified by faith and by faith alone. There is no contradiction between James and between Paul. And here is the verse. Here's Abraham one moment before, he was complaining because God wasn't coming through for him. Now, God says, look at the stars. That's what your seed is going to be like. And it says, Abraham believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, accounted it to him for righteousness. Can you remember the word we used last time to describe this in the last session? This is imputation. This righteousness was credited to him. So, even so, Abraham wanted to be 100% sure that God's promise was fulfilled. And so he asked for a guarantee, an assurance, for a sign which would confirm God's word to him. In reality, he was asking God to enter into a binding agreement with him to enter into a covenant. And so here we see how the understanding of covenant has come to boost and to strengthen our understanding of justification. The covenant that God cuts with us is there to guarantee that God is the justifier of the one who believes in Jesus and is just as well as in doing that. In other words, he pardoned sins justly. Now, Abraham, all he had to do was he saw the stars, and he said, now I believe. I actually believe. I believe that this is going to happen. I believe your word, Lord. I believe you. And God then credited it to him as righteousness. In other words, justification. The gift of God's righteousness is by faith and faith alone. It happened to him then. It was given to him then. Abraham's future failures did not negate what God did then. It didn't undo his justification. You can't ever undo your justification because it's dependent upon your relationship with God that God has given to you as a free gift. It is a righteous standing before God. It is not anything to do with your conduct before him. Now, God responds by setting up a covenant. And you know the story. Abraham has to sacrifice animals and the burning a torch comes. It's, it's a, a picture of God coming in fire, passing through the broken pieces of animals, saying that God was going to 
cut a covenant and keep the covenant. And this shows what happened at Calvary foreshadows the time when God himself would make a similar covenant with the blood and broken body of Jesus Christ. And what God was saying was that if, if I break my word to you, then let me become as one of these broken pieces of animals. And what happened, of course, was that God did become like that one day in the person of Christ on the cross. But it wasn't for God's breaking of the covenant. It wasn't through his unfaithfulness. It was because he was sending a substitute sacrifice for our unfaithfulness. So this old covenant helps us to understand that Christ's blood on the cross is God's solemn pledge that he will keep his covenant of forgiveness with us. The blood, therefore, is a God-given aid to faith. It's the assurance we need for our weakness. As well as the blood of atonement, it's the blood of assurance. It's God's rainbow in our lives, which is rather like the gift of the Spirit of God, who is the pledge and seal for us in the new covenant. Then moving quickly on in this quick survey of covenants in the Old Testament, we come to the covenants of Israel, the covenant with Israel. Now, many people teach, you've probably read this many times, that the covenant with Israel is suddenly now a covenant of works. The earlier covenants were covenants of grace. Now suddenly this is a covenant of works because the law is given at this point. But you must understand that all God's dealings with Israel before the law, during the law, were by grace. They were based on God's promise to Abraham. It was God's promise to Abraham, in you shall the families of the earth be blessed. It was that covenant promise which God was working through out the history of the Jewish people. And so just as God's covenant with Noah and Abraham were declared in several stages, so also God has made one covenant with his people through Moses in several stages. Now we must understand that this covenant that we read about in the book of Exodus the covenant of the law, the covenant with Israel, was made with the people who had already been chosen, who had already been redeemed and created as a people and adopted by God's sovereign grace. And so this covenant was made to a covenant people, to made to a people who had received God's promise. And so this is taking the covenant promise into a new dimension for very, very special purposes. The same spiritual relationship which was at the heart of the covenants with Noah and Abraham, was also at the center of the covenant with Israel. God was in fellowship with his people. Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, when uh, we find here Moses speaking and God talking to, to him about what was happening, God says, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. This was a relationship-based covenant. When God made a covenant with the children of Israel concerning the law, he was making a covenant with the people whom were already his people. And we find, too, that God's gracious initiative was also at the forefront of this covenant. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 to 8. Now therefore, if indeed you obey my voice and keep my covenant, yes, it's a conditional element here, but look at the emphasis of God's initiative. Then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the earth, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Verse 7. Then the Lord uh, then Moses went and spoke to the children of Israel concerning all of that. And uh, then the people said, oh, verse 8, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. So God, God's agreements with Israel is often called a covenant of law or works because there is so much emphasis on Israel's obedience to the law. But we must understand that the law was given in addition to God's basic promise that had been given to Abraham. So the law was added alongside the promise for a very, very special purpose. What was that purpose? Mainly for tutelage. God was wanting to bring discipline to his people and to show them that blessings and curses were associated with obedience and disobedience. 
And so he said, the promise is, I will be your God, and you'll be my children. I'm going to bless you, but you've got to understand, I'm a holy God, and I demand that you walk the way that I want you to walk. And so if you disobey me, then you're going to be chastened and chastised. If you obey me, then you're going to be blessed. And so this was the purpose of the law. Now, none of these obligations were preconditions of the covenant. God didn't say, look, if, if you, uh, uh, first of all, I give you the law, then I'll make a covenant with you. No, he said, I make a covenant with you, and now I've added to that covenant some stipulations which you must follow for your good and for my purposes in this world. And so in, in a real sense, you can trace the continuity in all of these covenants, and the central covenant promise, it doesn't matter which covenant it is, is that God says, I'll be your God, and you shall be my, my people. But that covenant comes in successive stages, and there are differences. You don't just say all the covenants are the same. No, these are different covenants, but also they build on the same principle, and in that sense, you can see it's the one covenant that God is making in lots of different stages. So these successive covenants created the possibility of God's people living in a covenant relationship with them and walk with him and walking with him in his holiness. And this, incidentally, is carried right on into the new covenant. Take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, be also holy in all your conduct. Hebrews 12 verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. So what we're talking about here is our obedience or disobedience gives us the enjoyment of the blessings of the covenant or withholds those blessings from us. The obedience or disobedience do not establish the covenant, but it gives us the means by which we can enjoy the covenant. Now, some believers interpret the fact that uh, Israel said, Lord, well, we're going to take on everything that you've said, and particularly in Exodus chapter 24, verses 7 and 8, when the book of the covenant had been written, and Moses reads it all out, and then it says, Exodus 24, verses 7 and 8, and then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. That kind of text makes people believe that this is a legal covenant and this is a different covenant from the covenant of grace. But it's not really as you see it because these people were already redeemed, already graciously chosen. God was now adding some conditions alongside that promise to make sure that they would know he was a holy God and the way to walk with the holy God and enjoy him is to obey him. So this covenant with Israel did not begin at that moment. The covenant began back with Abraham and the law was simply an addition to this pre-existing covenant. And the people knew that God was a covenant-keeping God because he delivered them from Egypt. He also knew, they also knew that the covenant was already in operation. And they knew that by God's grace, this covenant had been given and received. Now, the agreement between God and the children of Abraham already existed. But the law was being added to that covenant. So, this means that the promise of obedience that we've just read in Exodus 24 and verse 7 was not their way into the covenant. It was their commitment to living in the covenant by the law. It was their response to the grace of God. This is a principle that runs throughout the whole of Scripture. Your response to the grace of God is a commitment to obey Him in everything. Amen? Now, throughout all of the Sword of the Spirit teaching, I stress that as believers in the New Covenant, we are called to what I call gospel obedience. What's this? This is a particular enabled obedience to the rule of God. It's not legalistic obedience. In other words, let me obey God and then he'll love me. No, I obey him because he loves me. 
I can't make him love me by my obedience because he loves me anyway. Nothing that I do or fail to do makes him love me more or less. But the point is this. Once we realize how much God loves us and what he's done for us, then that obedience that comes from our lives is a different kind of obedience. It's not an obedience to earn his favor, but it's an obedience that responds to his favor. Now, the type of obedience in the New Covenant is very different from the legal obedience even in the Old Covenant times. But we must remember that the obligation of obedience in the New Covenant is in principle the same obligation which is featured in all God's covenants. Now what is that? I mean, we were, we're t sticking very rigidly for the sake of the filming and our agenda to, to, to lecture format. And if I was in a more seminar mode and in, interact, I'd ask questions right here and now and to ask what, what, is, what is the similarity? What is it all about? What was, the, what was God wanting to do when he defined the laws? He was wanting to produce a character which is defined by a single word. What is it? To live a life of love. Isn't that what God was wanting to do? And that's why the New Testament can say love is the fulfilling of the law. God has not dropped his standards, not at all. In fact, it could be argued that God has tightened his standards if such a thing were possible. Certainly in the Old Testament, much of the laws that the people uh, obeyed were ritualistic external laws, but God was more concerned about what was going on in your heart than whether you wove together fabric of two different kinds of cloth. Uh, two different kinds of thread. You understand? So, uh, and then when we come to the New Testament, Jesus said, you've heard it said that don't, don't commit adultery, but I'm telling you about the lust that's in your heart. You've heard about murder, but let me tell you about the anger that's in your heart. And in many ways, the, 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 the standard has intensified. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not going to enter into heaven, into the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to enjoy the blessings of God. And so, we, there's no way that we can say the Old Testament is all about God's law and the New Testament is about God's grace. And in the Old Testament, they weren't saved. In the New Testament, we are saved by grace and we can do as we like. Not at all. 